so uh right so this is may god it's the evening is, well, the year is whizzing away uh doo -doo -doo -doo. and uh tonight we've got pete williamson uh who's come to talk to us um about the moons of the solar system um we've uh, booked uh, pete a long while ago to do uh, his very uh, famous uh from herschel to hawkwind talk and it's best done really in person and he really um, we all really like the idea of doing it in the museum so what we've done is uh, we've rescheduled that one and we're going to do that next year uh, when uh, we should be back in the museum everything fine and so we can actually do it that particular talk in herschel's um, own uh, building own uh, house in bath which should make it a little bit more magic uh, for us and also hopefully for pete as well okay so um, uh, the usual contact points, uh, this slide doesn't change much uh, month on month, but you might notice that the numbers are going up. Our current membership is now 49, um, which is uh, nice. So uh, thank you to all uh, the new members that have come in, those people that um, uh, joined last year and have continued their membership. Thank you very much. Um, it does create a small little problem for uh, us, and it's it's a very nice problem to have, in that we use a system called Member Mojo um, to uh, record all our things, and the price goes up when we get to 50 members. So um, it's a nice uh, little additional cost to have that we get up there, and it means that um, uh, the longevity of the club is um, more assured by having a larger number of members uh, sharing sort of all the joy out um, if people want to get involved in sort of the task and things that's great but yep so you've got your committee there we've got Abby Chris Jonathan Mike and myself um, so if you want anything just drop us a line um, if you see us in the street flag us down um, whatever um, but just let us know uh, the worst thing that you can do is is be silent if you um, would like to uh, find out more would like to get more involved then and it only takes an email, only takes a phone call, only takes um, uh, a messenger note. Okay. Okay, so what's happening? Um, if we go through, so uh, on the 10th of June, we've got a partial solar eclipse um, that will be visible from uh, the UK. Um, so uh, you need to if you do plan to um, uh, enjoy that uh, now's a good time or the next couple of weeks a good uh, period to prepare for that uh, it'll be in, in the morning of the 10th um, and it hopefully if it's uh, cloud free it should be nice to see a bite taken out of the sun it's not a total one you will need uh, eye protection at all times or use uh, things like um, solar projection to protect your eyes but um, it's an annual eclipse um, so that should be fun um, we've got a joint talk on the 19th of June uh, with Wells and Mendip. Um, uh, Wolfgang, Dr. Wolfgang Steinbeck um, is giving us a talk and um, it, it's you need to reserve yourself a ticket. So um, I put a, a happy URL in there. If you do Wolfgang uh, 2021, it'll take you to the um, uh, Billito ticketing uh, place. The tickets are free. Um, but just so that we know who's coming and the, the links for the talk will come through there. And he's talking all about the Herschel family, um, all about um, Herschel's uh, impact on science. So that, that's a good one on Saturday the 19th. So if you're interested, go to bathstrongs.org.uk slash Wolfgang 2021 and that will take you through to the Billito site. Uh, on the 21st of June, uh, we're supporting the Herschel Society um, with their uh, solstice. Uh, we'll be out, uh, solstice celebrations will be out in the garden with the solar telescopes having a look. So we're very sun centric in June, but uh, hopefully the cloud will stay away. And I just picked up um, and we were talking to Charles about um, the starlit skies and uh, managing light pollution and reducing it. Uh, they've actually got a, a panel where uh, sort of uh, four of our illustrious um, how can I say, champions of light pollution in Bath and this area in the Somerset area um, will be available on Zoom and we'll be talking, that panel will be talking about uh, what we can do, why it, we should be fighting against uh, poor decisions in terms of lighting and planning and uh, that kind of thing. So if you need any more details, uh, just let us know. I'll probably put something up on Facebook, um, but if you go to um, the uh, Herschel Society uh, webpage, then there's more information on that particular event. Uh, it's an, an evening event and you can attend by Zoom if you want to. 
And the uh, next meeting we have will be on the 30th of June. That's a members night. So uh, we've got a number of people that will be presenting there. So uh, that should be lots of fun. There's sort of a, a, sort of a real um, uh, mix of people's experience in astronomy, what they've been up to, perhaps some of the trips they've taken. Um, and so uh, we'll get to have a good chinwag about our own personal experiences um, uh, with astronomy. And uh, we are getting back into the outreach world. So we've got two events that uh, Bath astronomers will be um, uh, attending, uh, where we'll uh, be entertaining people's kids, uh, but we'll also have the telescopes out. Uh, we'll also be doing rocket launches, that kind of thing at some of the local shows. So two shows that we'll be running this year, um, as planned, um, are Wellow and Bathampton. So we'll be attending those. So that should be fun if you wanted to come along, or if you want to actually support on the day, more than welcome. And on the 29th of September, we'll actually start our new uh, season of meetings, and that will be with Pete Richardson. He's just co completed the build of a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope that he's built every component, including um, uh, grinding the mirrors, all the flats, doing all the measurements. And he's done everything bar. Actually, I don't think he's made the eyepieces. That's the one bit he hasn't made. But having built a 10 inch, he's now moving on to a 20 inch. So he's going to become tell the story of that. Uh, we've spoken to, um, uh, to Pete a couple of times before um, about midway through the journey. And now um, another reason why we've got this out is we hope that he can bring that telescope along and actually show his handiwork um, at the September session, which we currently plan to have in the museum, uh, COVID regulations uh, permitting. Um, I talked about outreach being back. It has. I've been back into a school. Um, so I went to Hayward Prep last week and I taught uh, the year twos all about solar astronomy and um, people like this. We also had a go with the Folks Telescope. So uh, in the assembly, we had um, the children choosing targets to take photos of um, using the uh, Folks Telescope um, of galaxies. So there they were sitting in caution, uh, controlling a telescope in Siding Springs, which made them very happy. And as I understand from the teachers, they were still um, uh, very excited up until Friday last week. And so it's good to keep them busy. Uh, th there was other activities as well. We did gravity wells and we made rockets, uh, which they launched across the schoolyard as well. And uh, those are some of the uh, images that were uh, coming out of the Fox telescope that they uh, chose. So we've got the sombrero there and a few others. And uh, we did do solar observing, so using white light. And uh, we also had uh, the hydrogen alpha PST um, from the museum set up as well. So they got to see sunspots and they got to see uh, prominences as well. And so it was a, a, a particularly uh, fun activity. And uh, we managed it with the risk assessments and sort of uh, I was wearing gloves all the way through, masked up. Um, and I wasn't actually allowed near the telescope without covers on and things like that. But it was, hey, we managed it. It worked really well. And the kids had loads of fun, which is the most important thing. Um, we may well have had an impact on some people's futures there, but at least they had a lot of fun. Uh, so what we got this coming month uh, that you might want to have a look at? Well, uh, <laughs> the main one has to be uh, the partial solar eclipse. Uh, so this is a Stellarium just simulating uh, what uh, we could see. It's going to be just a third. That's, that's the extent of the nibble. The maximum there is 11 o'clock in the morning and that will move away. Uh, we've had a few sunspots recently, so fingers crossed there'll also be some um, uh, spots on the sun to look at. And there's been a few prominences as well. The sun activity has picked up. So it might not just be you're looking at the bite out of the sun. You might actually have um, some uh, really good uh, surface features on the sun as well. So uh, make sure that you've got uh, adequate protection for your eyes, because at no point is it safe to look at the sun. Uh, this isn't a total solar eclipse, it's a partial. Um, so uh, if you remember up until about oh, two weeks ago, then you should have received a pair of solar glasses through the post. Um, uh, and those are approved ones. They've got CE marks on them. Uh, if you're going to use your own telescope, you'll need to make sure that you've got um, the appropriate uh, white light filters or using Herschel wedges. You need to know what you're doing uh, or if you're using a hydrogen alpha telescope. 
Uh, alternatively, if you've got a smaller uh, diameter telescope, you can use projection, right? Uh, you don't go anywhere near the eyepiece, but uh, the light coming out of the eyepiece, you could uh, shine onto a piece of white card uh, or against a wall uh, in the shade, and you can actually see things going on uh, there. So there's lots of safe ways to look at it, but uh, everyone's to look after their eyesight. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, so what else have we got uh, coming up in June? Uh, we've got the last quarter moon. Uh, Jupiter is still well aligned, so there's lots of fun things going along the surface. So there's a number of transits of the shadows of uh, the moons going across Jupiter. I think there's three or four uh, this month. So if you're an early bird, um, because Jupiter's a morning planet, um, then you can pick up on a number of these transits going on. Um, they're all a little bit different, um, whether you've got, I think on the second, it's just Io, on the fifth, you've got Io and Ganymede, and they're going to be on top of each other. So you actually see two shadows on uh, the surface of Jupiter at the same time. Uh, the tenth, of course, is a new moon, and that's why you get the partial solar eclipse at this time of year. And um, we've got uh, Venus and the moon looking particularly nice. So if you like two toenails uh, in the sky through an eyepiece, they'll be particularly close. Uh, just about, uh, uh, I think it's a, a, a moon diameter, uh, uh, and a half, uh, they'll be distanced from each other. So if you've got the right eyepiece, you might be able to see them in the same uh, view. Uh, first quarter moon, uh, summer solstice when we'll be at the museum, uh, full moon, and then more transits. Um, but one of the things that has just picked up, uh, this is a satellite image uh, from the AIM satellite, uh, which uh, looks at UV reflectivity in the upper atmosphere. And what this is telling you is that ice is starting to form at high altitude, 80 to 85 kilometers um, above the polar regions. And this is what you need to see noctilucent clouds. So in the last week or so, um, the conditions, the temperature has dropped over the polar regions um, sufficiently for these ice clouds to start forming. And so um, in the coming days, coming weeks, throughout June, then there's a chance that we might get something like this of a prease of what we saw uh, from White Sheet Hill uh, last year. So these are noctilucent clouds, um, something like uh, three or four in the morning. So uh, you need to look uh, about uh, 60 minutes, 90 minutes to uh, two hours after sunset, um, look to the northeast, uh, sorry, northwest. Um, and in the morning, again, about uh, 90 minutes before sunrise, look to the northeast, and uh, that's your best chance for seeing them. They are low down, so only a few degrees above, so you need a good horizon to see them, otherwise you'll miss them. But um, it was quite special last year, and Sandy caught these images um, with Neowise, so that was a special moment for us all. Um, I'll remember that one for a, a while to come. Um, so I did talk about uh, the gathering uh, next month. We've got uh, Charles has uh, promised to do something, Jonathan, uh, Mike, uh, Richard, uh, Rob, Roger, Sandy, and Tony. And uh, if we are desperate, then you might even get me. Uh, but if anyone else wants to uh, get involved, then please let us know. Um, Abby is going to be our master of ceremon uh, ceremonies for the evening. And so uh, you've got a, a month for those that have promised to get involved. You've got a month now. Any worries, just drop me a line. Uh, I'll drop out a little note um, about how we're going to organize the evening. Um, Abby and I will uh, to all those who've said yes so far. And uh, I look forward to it. Now, uh, I I'd normally allow myself to rabbit 15 minutes. That's my 15 minutes. So uh, tonight's speaker is Pete Williamson, uh, FRAS. Um, what can I say about Pete? Well, um, I, I first met Pete um, at an astronomy and music event called Solar Sphere. He was running around, uh, looked very, very busy. Um, and eventually I found out that he's the guy who runs it. He, he started it. Um, but uh, in the last year during COVID, I've got involved in Reach Out and Touch Space with Pete. Uh, it's a radio show. It's created by Pete and it helped thwart all the COVID gloom that was going on in the astro community by gathering people together and having a good chin wag a couple of times a week about what was going on in space, what people were doing with their telescopes, um, news, and also an opportunity for people to ask questions. So um, it's been therapy for lots of people, I must say, including myself. Um, Pete's been involved in astronomy since a young age. Um, I think he got his first telescope at the age of 11. 
Um, but uh, as I understand it, uh, he managed to blag his way uh, from school. He saw an observatory and blagged his way in, knock on the door. Can you let me in, mister? And he actually managed to get access to that telescope as well. Pretty good for a plucky 11 year old. Um, uh, he joins Kidderminster Astronomical Society uh, when he was 12 and then started building his own six inch reflector. I don't know many 12 year olds that would take that on. Uh, these days. But then again, that was one of the only options. If you wanted a good telescope back then, you had to build it yourself. Um, he got involved in lots of astrophotography. Uh, he was high prig film. This is the old 35 mil film. Um, and he was doing loads and loads of stuff. But of course, um, as a lot of people felt as uh, interested in astronomy at a young age, other things come, whether it's love, his, his also his love of music, uh, uh, IT, all these things, having a job, they tend to push astronomy out. Um, but it wasn't until uh, 1989 um, that uh, he sort of got back seriously into uh, things and uh, started uh, getting uh, his astronomy wings back in. Um, so he built, a, a, so he purchased a new 10-inch uh, uh, reflector, and he was away then. Now, what do you do when you've moved to a place and there's no Astro Society? Well, what Pete, he, he started his own. He started Whist uh, Whittington Ast Astronomical Society, uh, which later became Shotra Astronomical Society. Um, so that's really cool. And he, in uh, 1994, he became a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And he's been a busy chap ever since. He's never really uh, slowed down in anything. Um, uh, up until his effective retirement, he was a professional bass player. Um, uh, but that hasn't held him back. And in fact, his love of music, his love of astronomy go together. Um, he's, as I say, he founded the Solar Sphere uh, Festival, which was running annually. Uh, it was cancelled last year. It's cancelled this year, but it will be up and running again in uh, 2022. So if you want something to do in midsummer, and then there's nothing better than go to Bilf Wells in Wales and enjoy not just the music, but also the astronomy and all the talks that, um, that are organized there. Several hundred people come along with that uh, joy of both uh, listening to music and staring at the sky. Uh, he works with uh, Cardiff University. Uh, he he's a consultant for the Fox Telescope Project. He's a SLU ambassador. He's got so many things uh, that he's got uh, his fingers in. It's amazing. But he, he frees up uh, time each summer to go down to uh, a number of Cornish schools. Um, so it's effective uh, a busman's holiday, going around to schools and educating and doing astronomy reach, uh, outreach as well. Um, so without too much more ado, let's have a look at some of the images and things that uh, Pete's been playing around with recently. He's fallen in love with Percy. Um, and uh, the high-res cameras and uh, there's, a, there's a small danger that Pete has become a bit of a geologist as uh, he takes the um, uh, high-res images and so when he picks these up off NASA uh, then they're uh, I, as I understand it they're multicolor and he brings them together he balances them out and sharpens up and actually uses all his skills that he normally uses for deep space and the Juno work um, to actually get the best out of the images that are coming out of NASA um, there's a lot of science in those images, but with a bit of flair and a bit of skill, then you can make some very beautiful images out of all these scientific shots. Anyway, I've talked way too much. So over to you, Pete, <laughs> and you Thank can you. take us through the moons of the solar system. Yeah, let's uh, share the screen. Uh, where are we? Screen share. Sound. That should share. Tell me if you can see it OK. Can you see that OK? Yes. Good, good, good. Yeah, as Simon said, um, yeah, for I left when I left school, um, other things took interest, and girls was one of them, obviously. Um, and a career in music helped that immensely. So it was, do I, do, do, do I become a pref professional astronomer or a professional musician? I chose musician. Uh, up until about 12 years ago when I swapped to being a professional astronomer. Uh, so that's, that's how that came about. And I was going to come down and do uh, Herschel to Hawkwind, but obviously I can't. And that was a talk that involves music and astronomy. So we decided to uh, postpone that till next year. And um, hopefully I'll see you all in person next year and uh, we, can, we can do that. So I put this talk together recently 
uh, moons of the solar system. Reason behind that it, this is um, obviously we're out at Mars looking to see if we can find any evidence of life. Um, but I feel uh, personally, and that's my personal opinion, that life isn't going to be found ever to have existed on Mars or on Mars uh, to this day. I think we're going to find this out in the solar system, probably on one of the moons such as Europa, Ganymede or, or Enceladus. So uh, I thought I'd just put this little talk together about the moons. And we'll start off with my view of the solar system. And you'll notice in that view of the solar system, I have Ceres, which is representing the asteroid belt, and I've got Pluto and Sharon. And those that know me personally know that my, my ongoing um, campaign to have Pluto as a planet still, um, because I don't know, d d does anybody disagree with me? Is Pluto a planet or not? I can see Simon's face on that one. It's a planet, isn't it? And I'll tell you for why. I'll tell you for why. Now, listen to this one. Simon will know this. I interviewed Alan Stern on the radio. Now, what did Alan Stern do? He sent horizons to Pluto, didn't he? He sent it to Pluto. And I said, Alan, is Pluto a planet? He said, of course it is. Astronomers don't know what they're talking about. He said, if you went to the Pluto in the Starship Enterprise and looked out the window, he said, what would you see? He said, you'd see a planet. If Alan Stern can say that's the definition of a planet by seeing it out the window of the Enterprise, I'll go with that. I'll run with that one. So we're going to we're going to class it as a planet in this one anyway. So a moon. What is a moon? Well, a moon is an object that orbits a planet. Um, but back in the 18th century, there were people, there were scientists at the time trying to define the Earth moon system because of the ratio of the size of the moon to the Earth. They were trying to um, um, uh, give it the category as a double planet system. It's not a double planet because, as we know, a moon, a moon is a, a, an object that um, orbits a planet and the planet orbits the sun. And that's a nice little video showing that uh, aspect. So we get that one out of the way, that the moon is the Earth and the moon system is an Earth and moon system and not a double planet, as scientists used to think. And I've got books in my bookshelf here where it's actually a book written by Robert Ball back in the 1800s, where he defines the Earth and the moon as a double planet system. He also defines the sun as being made of coal, but we won't go down that road. Um, but the first person to identify moons, obviously, was Galileo, who identified the four Galilean satellites, as we know today, of Jupiter. And he, he discovered these um, back uh, with his telescope back in the 1600s. And that got him into a lot of trouble, uh, of course, by looking at Jupiter's moons, the movement of the moons around Jupiter, the phases of Venus and sunspots. He determined that the sun was rotating. He determined that Venus had to be, to be between us and the sun. So therefore, the sun was the center of the solar system and not the Earth. And as I say, that got him into a lot of trouble. And when he published his new findings in a book called Sidereus Nuncius or Starry Messenger, he was put on he was put on lockdown effectively, like we all were, but he was put on lockdown for the rest of his life by the church for coming up with that uh, theory that the uh, the sun was the center of the solar system. And we can see here one of Galileo's original drawings, original musings of uh, as he mapped the moons orbiting Jupiter, and that gave him the uh, inspiration to, to, to determine that the sun was the centre of our solar system. And of course, Kepler went on to confirm his findings. Um, and I'm, I, I would imagine most of you have seen the uh, Galilean satellites, and as Simon was talking, we're going to have transits of the Gal Galilean satellites pretty soon. Um, and that's a photograph. Yeah, I did take that actually in my back garden. I do go out sometimes uh, with my four inch refractor in my back garden, a four inch scientific uh, explore scientific refractor triplet. And that was a photograph I took of uh, Jupiter and its four Galilean satellites a few years ago. So we can see them there. But Galileo also um, mapped our moon or, or, or was the first person ever to observe our moon through a telescope as we uh, as we believe. And as I say, that picture that he uh, drew there, I wouldn't say that's particularly accurate. And I would imagine that is probably supposed to be Tycho. But, you know, that is probably one of the first ever drawings of our moon through a telescope. The first time we ever saw um, the moon through a telescope. So that's that is pretty, uh, pretty important. 
And of course, we know how the planets were formed. Um, the sun, first of all, gas and dust um, collapses, um, nuclear fusion occurs under gravity. Um, the debris that's left over forms planets by the same uh, from the accretion disk that uh, has appeared around the sun and been left around the sun. And then debris left around the planets forms into moons. But we've got two moons uh, with two planets on the inner part of our solar system, Mercury and Venus, and they've got no moons. Now, a question was raised recently when I was doing this talk. Was, the moon, was Mercury ever a moon of Venus? Is it possible that Mercury was ever a moon of Venus? Did Venus ever have a moon? Probably not, because Mercury, as we know, is basically the core that is left of a planet that is basically burnt away. But it's, an, it's, a, it's a question that people do raise. You know, these questions, was it ever a moon of uh, Venus? I probably don't think so. And I think uh, somebody was raised shaking their head then, and I agree with them, probably not. Uh, but did they ever have moons? Did Mercury ever have a moon? Did Venus ever have a moon? Mercury, probably not, because Mercury being so close to the sun, the sun would have perturbed moons orbiting around Mercury and probably dragged them in or caused the moons to collide into Mercury. So I very much doubt it. Did Venus ever have a moon? Well, we're not going to know. We don't know. Um, so we'll just have to take it that it hasn't had a moon and hasn't got a moon. But we know our moon was formed, or we believe our moon was formed, uh, from an impact by a planetary uh, body called Thea, about the size of Mars. It gave glancing, uh, glancing gl uh, blow to Gia about 4.5 billion years ago. That caused an accretion disk um, around the Earth. That, and we believe that that formed into two moons, which eventually coalesced into one moon. But one question kids always ask in schools is, OK, so gas and dust collapses. How does it collapse? Well, it collapses under ele electrostatic um, forces. And then when the bodies get big enough, gravity takes over and that form causes them to collapse even further. But we haven't been able to see that happen until uh, we went to, into space, to the space stations. And here's a little uh, video of particles coming together in the International Space Station. Particle agglomeration. Here we have a gallon sized plastic bag filled with one millimeter diameter sodium chloride crystals. You shake this up and the individual crystals will rapidly form agglomerates and these in turn form flocules of the order of several centimeters on a side and all of this happens in about 10 seconds. Here is a slow motion view of the same thing showing the individual crystals rapidly forming agglomerates and again these form flocules all within about 10 seconds. So effectively on a smaller scale that's what's happening in in zero gravity. Particles are coming together eventually they'll coalesce and eventually they'll form a body either a planet or a moon or a star depending on the process. But we have our own moon and we're all very familiar with our own moon. Some of us love it, some of us hate it. It gets in the way of a lot of uh, deep sky observing, but I always find the moon a very fascinating object uh, just, just to sit and look at um, without a telescope, just to sit in the garden, watch the moon rise coming from behind the trees. It's always an inspiring uh, sight. But the, the moon orbits the Earth, it's at a distance of 252,000 miles or so. Um, its orbital period is 27.3 days. It's one lunar day, is 27.3 days. That effect causes this, the moon to always have the same face towards us. We only ever see the same face of the moon um, from the Earth. And of course, the ratio, as I said, the ratio between the moon and the Earth is quite unique in the solar system in the fact that it's a quarter the size of our Earth. And uh, the temperature on the moon is minus 233 degrees in the shade, 123 degrees plus uh, in direct sunlight. And that's because having no atmosphere, when the lunar astronauts were on, on, the, um, on the moon, if they stepped into the shade, they were instantly in freezing temperatures. And when they stepped outside of the shadows, they were in boiling temperatures. And I spoke to Neil Armstrong myself about that. And he was explaining to me how that felt when you were on the moon and how well those suits had to be designed to stand up to these 
fluctuations in temperature that could happen so quickly. But we'll take a look at a lovely little video of uh, the phases of the moon, a lovely one for outreach, this one. Um, it shows the phases of the moon. We see phases from the Earth as the sun falls onto different parts of the lunar surface, depending on where it is in the orbit around the Earth. And we can see there, um, it, as I say, there's a lovely little outreach video, that one, Simon. I don't know if you've got that one, um, but you can speed it up and slow it down. And it shows all the craters, all the lunar si uh, landing sites. And kids just love that one. And that one, they do one every year for, um, for, 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 for the whole year. So it's well worth getting. Is that the Scientific Visualization Studio? The ones that they do there on yeah. NASA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. If you haven't got it, I'll send it down to you. But we also know that the moon keeps the Earth at its tilt. Uh, if it was that the Earth hadn't got that tilt and the moon didn't maintain that tilt, we wouldn't be getting seasons where we have the summer solstice or where we the uh, in June the 21st, not far away now, um, uh, where the northern hemisphere is pointing towards the sun, which is causes the sun to rise higher in the sky, giving us our summer. And of course, in the winter, uh, the northern hemisphere is facing uh, away from the sun, causing us to the sun to be lower in the sky, causing our winter. So if the moon, well, our moon wasn't there, chances are life wouldn't exist on the Earth anyway. Also, we have that unique thing we talk about, solar eclipse. We've got the partial one uh, on the, was it the 10th of June? 10th of June. Um, and uh, we know that the Earth, at this point in our, li in our life cycle on the Earth, at this point in time, which we are lucky, because of the distances between the, the moon is, fits exactly over the sun at this point in time. I mean, in the future, it won't. Uh, the, the, the moon will be further away and that we won't get that exact fit. So we won't get the lunar, uh, the solar eclipse like we, uh, we get now. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a solar eclipse, but it's an impressive sight. I've seen one in 1999. That's the only one I've ever seen. And I'll never, ever forget it. It's an emotional moment. I didn't think I'd get emotional when it happened. But when that totality happened, something just takes over in your head and it, 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 it really is a fantastic experience. And we also know that the moon causes the tides again um, with, the pull, with the pull of the oceans, causing a bulge in the oceans. It causes the tides to go, to go in and to go out. Um, and again, I think if we hadn't had those tides in the early days of the Earth's formation when we, when we had water um, and no life on the Earth, by mixing up the oceans and causing the acids and the, and the chemicals to mix together, uh, cause life to start. I, I don't think without our moon, we wouldn't have life. So although we might uh, curse the moon sometimes, we've got to be thankful for the fact that it's there. But the moon itself, it has a it has a core. It has a dense metallic core. The core is largely composed of iron and some nickel. The inner core is a solid mass of about 480 kilometers in diameter surrounding um, surrounding uh, uh, the inner part of the moon. Um, surrounding that is a molten area of the core, which is still molten, we believe, to this day. And um, since 2012, we've kind of come to think that the moon is st still geologically active. And we still think it's geologically active because we've noticed cracks in the lunar surface called graben. And this looks like that the moon is expanding and contracting, causing these cracks to appear. And these have been looked at by the, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we still do believe that the moon is active. But back in 19, ooh, going back 1992, I observed a lunar transient phenomena where I saw what looked like an outgassing from a crater, probably an impact or whatever. But I, I did observe that and it was confirmed that that did happen at the time. So the, I, I do believe that the moon is still active and many scientists where we've got some grab in there, a, a, a crack, in the lunar surface that appears to prove that the moon is expanding and contracting so that our moon is probably still still active to a certain extent. You can also look at old geological areas such as rills on the moon. This is one I took from my back garden um, with a Celestron 9 and that is um, Hadley Rill and where Apollo 15 landed. So you can observe many rills on the moon, many areas where the lunar surface has been active. Uh, so I love going out and observing these rills. I love 
you doing this on outreach, getting kids to identify the different rills on the moon and 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 uh, and plot them. So it's a nice outreach event thing to do as well. But we'll move on to Mars because Mars is in the news at the moment. I'm uh, at the moment working with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada um, via JPL to process perseverance images um, for their uh, outreach events. Uh, so it's quite an interesting thing at the moment. But Mars has got two moons. Are they moons? Of, uh, are they actually part of Mars or are they captured asteroids? I would hazard a guess looking at them that they are captured asteroids. There we got Phobos and Deimos, um, the two moons. They were discovered in uh, 1877 by astronomer Asaf Hall, and he named them after the Greek mythological twin characters Phobos and Deimos, who accompanied their father Ares into battle. But Ares later was renamed by the Romans as the god, uh, the, the, the sons of the god of war. So that's where we get the name Phobos and Deimos from. But you can, using some of the Mars data that I am processing, photograph Phobos in orbit around Mars. And that's a photograph that I processed recently of Phobos photographed in the Martian, hanging in there in the Martian sky. But you can also see cloud in the Martian sky as well. So you've got Phobos rising there above the Martian surface and you've got some cloud as well. So it's quite interesting that you can actually, using these uh, rovers now, photograph the moons of Mars. I've not seen any data with Deimos in it, but there's plenty of data there available where you can actually pull Phobos out of the, uh, out of the images. And I find this fascinating. I mean, especially being at my age now, approaching 65, um, the fact that when I was a kid, and we, I don't know if anybody remembers when Mariner 4 arrived at Mars, and we all thought we were going to see vegetation, and we all thought we were going to see cities. We... Even Patrick Moore on the sky at night in 1964 was disappointed when Mariner 4 arrived at, at Mars and we saw that it was just a cratered world. And NASA at the time did think that this was pointless sending more uh, craft to Mars because it looked like a dead world. But as we know, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting world to go to geologically. But there's another photograph that I've um, been processing where I've pulled Phobos out of the... Uh, uh, out of the image and you can see Phobos there hanging in the night sky on Mars. Have we ever sent probes to Phobos? Well, we've sent we, to Phobos or Deimos. Well, uh, the Russians did send a probe to Phobos, Phobos 1, which failed completely. Phobos 2, which arrived at Mars and did photograph Phobos from orbit, but it never managed to land on Phobos. But the Japanese will be sending another probe out there in 2024 to Phobos, a, land, a lander to take samples of the surface of the moon. And then that, then we'll know whether they are actually parts of Mars or they are captured asteroids. I still think that they're captured asteroids. Of course, I said we've got the asteroid belt and we got Ceres, which is the largest uh, body in the asteroid belt. Did Ceres ever have a moon? We're never going to know, really. Probably it may have done because asteroids do have moons. And this was the Galileo spacecraft image of asteroid 243 Ida, and its little tiny moon, Dactyl. So asteroids do have moons orbiting them. Uh, moons were first discovered to orbit asteroids back, around about 25 years ago when the first one was imaged. But uh, NASA is sending a DART mission to uh, Didymos, which is about 780 metres across, and it's got a moon of 160 metres across, and they're sending that probably any time after July 2021, there's been no fixed date yet. It'll be launched by a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, and it will arrive at the asteroid around about uh, eight months later. And, um, and it's going to try and take samples of the asteroid, not the actual asteroid itself, but the moon orbiting the asteroid. So that will be going out, and that's uh, an artist impression of the, um, of the mission that's going out uh, to Didymos. So that hopefully that will get out to get, get launched. And they said there's a possibility it will be launched in July 2021 if everything uh, runs according to plan. Um, I was speaking to Mark McCorkran from the European Space Agency, and he said there's a good possibility it will launch on time. So we move to Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter, we know, has 79 moons at present, 
Um, and of course, we know that they keep, find, they keep finding more moons all the time. Again, a lot of them are just captured um, asteroids and capture bodies that fall in towards Jupiter. But we know we talked about earlier the four Galilean satellites, now four very different satellites. Um, We've got Io, as we can see, the surface is very different to Io. We'll look at each one in, in, in depth in a minute. We've got Europa, uh, we've got Ganymede and Callisto. And if I had to put my money on it, um, if we were going to find any life on any of these moons, it's going to be uh, Europa. Um, the four big moons make up, we've got Io, and it's basically an iron-rich core, uh, molten silicate interior and a thin silicate crust. Um, we've got Europa, which is an iron-rich core, silicate mantle, thin ice crust, but also a subsurface ocean. And then we know that it's got a subsurface ocean, and we'll come on to uh, that in a minute, how we know it's got a subsurface ocean. And then we've got Ganymede, again, silicate, lower mantle, uh, partly molten iron core, um, icy upper mantle, ice crust. Um, and then we've got Euro uh, Callisto, which is the outer moon of Jupiter, which is basically just a mix of uh, iron rock and uh, ice so um four very very different moons but we first of all we come to io now io is the innermost of the four galilean satellites closest to jupiter it's about 3642 kilometers across and uh, it's the fourth largest moon in the solar system and it is marginally larger than our own moon and it's named after the priestess of hera who became one of the lovers of zeus now you're going to find out that zeus was a bit of a lad because every moon we come across, it was named after a lover of Zeus. I think this guy got about a bit, uh, this Zeus fella. But uh, yeah, it was um, named after after the goddess, uh, after the one of the lovers of Zeus. And it was at the time just referred to as Jupiter One. These moons were not given names till much later um, in, in the uh, early 18th, 1800s. Um, as I say, they were called Jupiter 1, Jupiter 2, Jupiter 3, Jupiter 4. And the same was with Saturn as well. Saturn's moons were called Saturn 1, Saturn 2, and so on. So Io is uh, Jupiter 1, and it has over. It is the most active body in the solar system. It has over 400 volcanoes, and it's uh, very, very geolo geologically active. And uh, most of these, well, at least 100 of these volcanoes are taller than Mount Everest. So it is a very, very interesting world. The reason it's so active is because it is so close to Jupiter and the tidal gravitational forces from Jupiter squeeze it and twist it and, and, and it, it keeps the interior extremely active. It has a very, very thin atmosphere too. It's got a, a very thin sulfur atmosphere. But when Voyager reached it, it was the first time we saw this moon um, relatively close up. When Voyager reached it uh, back in, in uh, the 70s and uh, 80s, that when the Voyager missions went up in, late, in the late 70s, the first image of Io we saw, the planetary scientists thought they discovered another moon because what they thought was another moon poking out, out from behind Io was actually an active volcano erupting as Voyager arrived. But because the pictures in those days before they were enhanced, were quite grainy. It did look, and you can see there on that picture there, that you can see that um, that plume there in the early picture did look like another moon just popping out from behind Io. And they actually thought they'd found another moon that uh, was sitting right behind Io. But as we said, Io is extremely active. To me, it looks like a pizza, uh, very much like a pizza. Um, and the close-up images you can see do show sulfur and, uh, and volcanic material all over Io's surface. Not a place you'd particularly uh, want to visit, but a very fascinating world and probably, as I say, the most active place in the solar system. Um, as we said, it has, it has its own magnetic field as well. Um, and it's also, as I said, has a very, very tenuous sulfur dioxide atmosphere. Um, so, yeah, it's well worth a uh, visit, I think, in the future. But to land on Io, we'd have to create, they'd have to build a spacecraft pretty similar to like the Venera landers that landed on Venus. It'd have to stand up to a lot of radiation, a lot of pressures, a lot of heat. Um, that's a, a Voyager compiled data picture of uh, Io and 
Europa. I just think I, I just thought I put, I put that in because it looks so uh, it looks so nice. I think it's a very attractive uh, picture that I love pictures of Jupiter. Actually, on my walls in my house, I've got lots of close up pictures of Jupiter that I processed myself from uh, from space probe data. But we come on to Europa or, as it was known as Jupiter 2, and it's the second of the four Galilean satellites and the second closest to Jupiter. Uh, it's uh, and the smallest at 3,121 kilometers in diameter, which is slightly smaller than our moon. The name comes from the myth mythological uh, noblewoman of, called Europa, who was again courted by Zeus and became the queen of Crete and was and, and the name became widely used in the 20th century. As I say, these moons didn't get their names till much later on. Some of them were named by John Herschel himself. Um, it has a smooth surface of, uh, and this surface, as we can see, is obviously getting some form of resurfacing from uh, the interior of the moon. And we now know that that is getting resurfaced from a uh, subsurface ocean. And you can see so from some of the uh, pictures here uh, where plumes have been photographed and these plumes are um, watery material coming from beneath the uh, moon's surface and then they're falling back onto the surface and restructuring the surface and you can see these smooth smooth lines here on the surface of Europa and they believe that the the surface the ice is falling the water is falling back onto the surface forming ice and then I, that ice is getting flexed again because of Europa's close proximity to Jupiter and the tidal forces are causing cracks in the ice. But uh, if I had to put money on it, I would say uh, out of the Jupiter, the uh, Jupiter system, the Galilean satellites, this is your best bet, the best bet for finding any form of life um, in, in, in the ocean below the surface. Okay, okay it's only going to be microbial life. Um, a minute you say life, people start to think aliens, spacecraft, invaders, tripods, no, microbial life. But it'd be interesting um, when they send out the probes that are going out there. One's going out later this year uh, from the European Space Agency, and the, the uh, mission will fly through the plumes and take samples to see what is in those plumes and if there is any chance of life below the surface. And then we come on to Callisto, uh, sorry, uh, Ganymede. Now, Ganymede, again, uh, is um, quite a large moon, 5,262 uh, kilometers in diameter, which makes it larger than the planet Mercury. So it's kind of a planet in its own right, really, uh, although it's a moon of Jupiter. And uh, Ganymede, or Jupiter 3, um, at the time it was called, is named after the mythological Ganymede cupbearer of the Greek gods, who was another one of Zeus's beloveds. And it's the only um, moon in the solar system that possesses a magnetosphere. And this is likely created through convection uh, within the liquid iron core. Again, the surface is getting uh, resurfaced. Um, it's a young surface. It's not very cratered. And this, again, is because of uh, the heating of the interior core, heating the subsurface ocean, causing that to break through the surface and refreeze on the surface causing a very very smooth surface and quite reflective as well uh, so we can see there and this has a tenuous oxygen atmosphere very very tenuous oxygen atmosphere but it has got one um, and most of these Galilean satellites have very very tenuous atmospheres and uh, not atmospheres that we would call a breathable atmosphere, but a very, very tenuous atmosphere. But it has got one basin, the Valhalla Basin, where it has had a massive impact, and that hasn't got resurfaced. And we can see that there where the uh, impact occurred there. And then we've got the shockwave from that impact. Then we come out to Callisto. Now, Callisto is the outermost um, Galilean satellite, it's fourth one, or known as Jupiter 4 at the time. And this is 4,820 kilometers in diameter. And it's named after the Greek mythological nymph, Callisto, who was, guessed it, a lover of Zeus. Um, so this, as I said, this Zeus fella, he got about. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a, a large moon, but um, possibility of life on this moon, probably not, because it has no subsurface ocean. 
it has no real tidal flexing caused by Jupiter. It's so far out from Jupiter um, that it's it's uh, pretty pretty much a dead world, pretty impacted world, as you can see. And one massive impact crater has occurred just here, as you can see here. And you can see the shock wave from that impact crater. So Callisto, as I say, doesn't come under the same tidal forces as the other three moons. It could be because it's much further out. Um, but it's again, it's got a very thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide, a very thin, tenuous atmosphere of carbon dioxide. And these atmospheres have only been really discovered um, since Cassini went out and, and the later probes. They weren't discovered. These atmospheres weren't identified when Voyager went out. They've been identified later. But that's a nice little video put together via using Voyager data of the two Io and Europa in orbit around Jupiter. Um, I just think that is is a beautiful sight, and it'd be lovely to be in orbit around Jupiter to actually see that. And then we come on to uh, the Jupiter's inner moons. It's got many inner moons, and these are wrapped up within its tenuous rings. And for those that don't know, Jupiter has got a ring system. It's a very tenuous ring system, but it has got a ring system. Um, and Hubble's identified this ring system. And you can... Uh, it's got many small moons within the ring system, some acting as shepherd moons, holding the, moon, the rings into place and causing the rings to be the shape that they are. So some of the moons have fell within the uh, ring system of Jupiter. Um, we've got a map there showing that the Galilean satellites are quite close in compared to a lot of the other moons. We've got some moons that are orbiting the same direction, very small moons. We're talking moons here, probably only six miles across, uh, very, very small moons. And some moons, which are obviously captured um, objects falling in from the asteroid belt, from the Kuiper belt, from outside the solar system, broken up comets. We saw Comet Shoemaker-Levy when it impacted Jupiter. That was a great thing to see. We all had a chance to actually view that live, which was uh, an amazing event. Uh, but lots of the objects that have fallen in, some fall in and end up orbiting retrograde in the opposite direction. Some orbit in the same direction and some orbit in strange uh, elliptical orbits that are off tilt compared to the rest. There are so many objects orbiting Jupiter and I sh I'm sure that they're going to find more and more and more and more are falling in all the time. Um, and then we come to Saturn. Now Saturn is a beautiful object to view through the telescope as we know and it's also got that very very strange uh, weather pattern that hexagon uh, on the top on the top of uh, its pole there. And uh, of course, it has the occasional storm and it had the great white spot was discovered by uh, Will Hay. Um, if ever anybody remembers Will Hay, the actor, he actually was a very famous astronomer. And there's another astronomer who actually identified storms on Saturn. And a lot of people didn't realize this. If I said, uh, come and look at what you would have won, uh, Jim Bowen, if everybody remembers Bullseye, Jim Bowen was a very well-known astronomer as well and actually did observe uh, storms on Saturn and documented quite a lot of storms on Saturn. Um, uh, Jim Bowen's no longer with us, of course. So Saturn has 62 moons, quite a few moons there. Um, that's just a, a little a glimpse of some of the sizes and the different sizes of the moons. But the most interesting moon, I think, around Saturn has to be Titan. But we'll come to Titan in a minute. And out of all the moons in the solar system, that has to be my favourite. Um, for reasons we'll go into. But the moons we're going to be interested in are Iapetus, um, and we're going to be interested in uh, Mimas and Enceladus and Titan. Now, those, those that are interested, uh, those obviously you meet in the Herschel Museum, so two of the moons of Saturn were discovered by William Herschel. So we'll go on to those in a second. But this is a little video put together by data from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's just nice to see the moons in orbit around, around Saturn. I think that's quite fascinating. But we come on to uh, the, the first moon, the innermost moon, and that is Iapetus. Now, Iapetus, as we can see, a strange shaped moon, a strange moon in the fact that it's dark on one side and it's light on the other. It was discovered uh, by Giovanni Cassini in 1672, but the icy moon was a challenge for him to discover because when it was on one side of Saturn, um, he could see the, 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 the shiny surface, it was reflective, 
and he could see it. And when it got to the other side of Saturn, because it's tidally locked, it keeps one side facing Saturn all the time, he couldn't see the moon. So it would, it would appear and disappear every 39 days. And he couldn't understand why. Then he worked out that one side had to be brighter than the other side. And, um, and, he, and his, his observations led him to believe that he had discovered a moon. Um, and why is the one side um, lighter than the other? Thermal observations of the moon taken by the Cassini mission provide the best insight into this, um, the, uh, this unique process. The slow rotation of the moon means that the dark surfaces, which absorb more heat uh, than the icy counterparts, have more time to warm. Now, when we say heat, we're not talking heat as we would think heat. We're talking on the hot side of uh, Iapetus, it's minus 143 degrees C. On the cold side, it's 100, minus 173 degrees C. So it's only a very small fluctuation in temperature. But what, they believe, what we believe is the gases on the, on the warmer side uh, rise from the heat, and then it, they fall back onto the other side where they freeze. And that's the reason we believe that there was this dark side and light side of Iapetus. The light side is extremely reflective. The dark side is extremely dark. And when it does get, when you do have the dark side facing the earth, it's very, very difficult to see. It also has an equatorial ridge encircling the, the moon completely. And why is this here? I mean, the, so many astronomers have come up with different theories, but there are three main theories are, number one, that the tidal forces from Saturn have caused the moon to bulge at its uh, equator. That's one theory. The other theory is that uh, debris from another moon fell on the surface of Iapetus, causing this ridge to occur around the, the equatorial region of the planet, uh, the moon. And the third um, theory is that part of Saturn's ring has fallen upon Iapetus's um, surface, causing this ridge. But this ridge, is 13 kilometers high and it circles the entire moon. And of course, we know that the moon itself is geologically active in its interior. It's still warm within its interior, still has an active core. Uh, and again, this is kept warm and kept active by the tidal forces from the planet Saturn because it is so, so close in towards the planet um, and it's, it's in a most moon. And as I say, it was named um, Saturn 1, but was later renamed as Iapetus by John Herschel. The next moon is Mimas, and uh, this was discovered by Sir William Herschel. And he, this was the second moon he discovered. Um, he discovered this on the 17th of September, 1789, and it was the seventh known moon of Saturn, it was the seventh known moon of Saturn at the time. And he spotted it um, in Celadus a month before. So he discovered Enceladus a month before he discovered Mimas. But we can see on Mimas that it has this massive impact crater. And that impact crater is called the, uh, the, the Herschel Basin. And uh, it does look like the Death Star. This moon is geologically active. And in fact, thermal imaging of this uh, moon has shown it to have a core that is rotating it's rotating at an odd angle, which causes a theory. Um, uh, 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 the thermal images to make it look like a Pac-Man. It looks actually looks like the Pac-Man. So this moon is wobbling in its orbit, and uh, again, the geological tidal forces from Saturn are keeping the interior molten and keeping this interior active. But many people believe that's it. That's really it. That's the moon Mimas. It doesn't. It does look like it, doesn't it? You've got to be honest. It does look like it. Yeah, go on. We'll have it. Um, but yeah, as I say, it looks like the Death Star. And it actually has been uh, named by NASA as the Death Star. But the crater uh, that, that you can see there, it is uh, 2,500 miles in, uh, uh, 246 miles in diameter. And the moon's only 2,500 miles in diameter. So it's a massive impact basin there and it, it may have near enough shattered that moon into pieces and reassembled but it is a fascinating moon but you can view this with your with your telescope from your back garden and then we come on to Enceladus then this is 
my bet for if you're going to find life in the Saturnian system, this is where you're going to find it. This was discovered by William Herschel by turning his 1.2 meter telescope to it on August the 28th, 1789. Um, and he was actually, when he turned this onto uh, Enceladus, he was actually just testing out the telescope at the time and discovered it totally by accident. He was testing out his 1.2 meter telescope and he discovered Enceladus. Most reflective object in the solar system, yet it's only 314 miles in diameter. The reason it is so reflective is because its surface is continually getting uh, resurfaced from water, ice, uh, from a, an ocean below the surface. And we can see that there, that it is a highly reflective and highly um, uh, smooth surface because it is constantly, constantly getting resurfaced. And we can see that there are plumes emitting and coming out from below the surface. And these are going out off into space, these plumes of water. And Cassini actually photographed and um, proved that this water ice was falling onto the rings of Saturn, helping to feed the rings of Saturn. But not only that, some of it was escaping beyond the rings and actually falling onto the upper cloud belts of Saturn itself. So it's a very, very active world. And we can see that this probably caused by hydro um, vents from its uh, core that are coming up through the ocean, forcing this water up through the, th the uh, surface, crossed and out into space. And these plumes are not just going a few feet into space, they're going thousands of miles into space. And again, another mission is going to be sent to take samples of these plumes of water. And if there is a chance of finding life, we may do because we have these um, hydrocarbon volcanic vents deep in our oceans. And we didn't think life could uh, exist there, but it does. It exists where there is no light. It exists in totally hostile um, conditions and even life exists down here. So if life can exist on the earth in these hydrocarbon vents, why can't it exist on Enceladus? I think it probably does. And uh, I think one of the, one of the um, lovely names that has been given it was given by one of the guys over at ESA and he says Enceladus has icy breath and I think it has and I'm just hoping that when we get these probes out to Enceladus that we find something but we come on to Titan now this is a fascinating world um, this is a, an image that I processed from uh, Cassini data and it's showing Titan sitting out there beyond the rings of Saturn and it just looks unreal doesn't it I mean, these images that came back from places like uh, from, from the Cassini probes when they got out to places like Saturn, it just looks unreal. But, you know, this is reality. And um, it's shrouded in a smog. Titan's moon is shrouded. Uh, is, it, the moon is shrouded in a smog. We've never been able to see the surface unless we radar map it. Um, we've radar mapped it with the Cassini probe. We've also radar mapped it with Hubble uh, taking infrared images. And what we've noticed is that as the Titan orbits Saturn, it has different seasons and we see features appearing and disappearing in different parts in different seasons, which proves again that this moon is active. It has oceans, but it has oceans of hydrocarbons. And somebody was asking, what would it be like to be on the surface of Titan? What would it smell like? It would smell like diesel fuel. It would be a, a really weird world to go. But they are looking to the fact that there may be um, uh, car, um, hydrocarbon based life at, on on Titan and they are going to be sending missions to Titan, one with a helicopter, pretty similar to what went to Mars. The, the, the helicopter is going to be called Dragonfly and they're hoping also to send a small submarine to dive into the hydrocarbon lakes that are on Titan. But Titan we couldn't see the surface. It's shrouded by this thick atmosphere, much, much thicker than the Earth's atmosphere, nearly 600 kilometers high, uh, the atmosphere on Titan, and um, totally, totally made up of methane and carbon dioxide and other um, substances. Those are the main two substances, uh, carbon dioxide and methane. But it's one of the places, the furthest place we've landed a probe in the solar system. We've actually landed a probe there. It was Huygens. Um, had the uh, 
pleasure of having John Zarnecki, who was involved in that probe, come to Solosphere to do a talk, fascinating talk about Titan. And he's convinced they'll find life on Titan. He's absolutely convinced that they will find life on Titan. But when the probe Hoygens landed on Titan, as it broke through the atmosphere, as it broke through the clouds, it was the most Earth-like moon that we'd come across. It was the most Earth-like moon that we'd managed to see the surface of. So this was the little video of the landing. Looking at the data from the uh, from the landing of Hoygens on Titan, they discovered that it has mountains some taller than 10,000 feet high. And it's identified also that there were hydrocarbon lakes on the surface of Titan. And one of the most fascinating ones is in the Southern Pole. But they really don't understand what's going on here because it's got a thing there called the Magic Island that appears at certain times of the year and disappears. And what they think it is is that, that the hydrocarbon lakes um, recede, uh, showing some sort of some land, and then um, they return again at different uh, parts in, when it's in different parts of its orbit. Um, and these hydrocarbon la lakes return very much like we have tides on the Earth. And these islands are covered, this island is covered up and this has been called the magic island because it appears and disappears and appears and disappears. But they, they, they thought it would be a regular event that would happen at a certain time, but it doesn't. It seems to happen um, on, a, on an irregular time scale. So they're still not sure what's causing this. But if this is if this is right, then it shows that the hydrocarbon lakes have tides pretty much like we have tides on the Earth. So Titan is probably the most uh, Earth like body in the solar system. Apart from, apart from anything else, it is going to be the most Earth like. And Scott Derrington, the mission, uh, the deputy project manager, of Cassini um, did a paper um, and this was depicting that when the sun expands and uh, it warms Titan that it could become another Earth for a short while so that'd be a, a really interesting concept and they say Titan is a proto-Earth, an Earth in the making so it's a fascinating world to go to and I can't wait till Dragonfly gets there and uh, flies around uh, the surface of Titan and also, the submarines diving into the, uh, the submarine diving into the um, hydrocarbon lakes on Titan.
But Saturn has other moons orbiting it, and it has shepherd moons. These are very small objects, no more than six or seven miles across, quite, quite small little bodies that orbit within the ring system. And these shepherd moons are exactly what they say. They're shepherds. They're holding the rings into their positions, and they're keeping the rings into the shapes that they're in. And we can observe many shepherd rings uh, from, from the Cassini data. Now, if you're into um, compiling or, or processing space probe data, Every little bit of Cassini raw, raw data is available online for you to download and process for yourself. It's free of charge. You just go to the Cassini site. And as I say, every single bit of data, all the data of the moons, the rings, the planet itself, um, it passes through the, between the rings. All the data is available uh, for you to take and process yourself. And again, if you're doing outreach, take that data into the schools to get the kids to process Cassini data. It's absolutely amazing, um, some of the data that you can process, and it's beautiful as well. But we come on to Uranus. Now, for those that remember Voyager, for those that are old enough, I know there's some of you just probably too young to remember Voyager. But when uh, Voyager arrived at Uranus, um, we, we didn't know what to expect. And the data we've got on Uranus now, the close-up data, is the only data we've got is Voyager data. And I've been privileged to be asked uh, by... Um, by the again by the Canadian um, uh, Astronomy Society via JPL, I've been given the project of reprocessing a lot of the Voyager data that came back on using uh, modern techniques. But we see the Voyager data there of, of of Uranus, and it was boring. It arrived and we looked at it and we thought, is that it? You, you know, the, we've waited so long for this data to come back, and that's all we're going to see. But now we know it has 27 moons um, and it has some interesting moons. It has uh, Titania, Oberon, Umbriel, Ariel, Puck. But one of the most fascinating moons uh, in, the, um, in the Uranian system uh, was Miranda. And this moon, again, the only data we've got is what came back from Voyager. It's, it, we've got nothing else, so we, we can only work with these images that came back from Voyager. And it shows a moon that we call the Frankenstein moon because it looks like it's been smashed apart and reassembled and uh, not very well put back together either. But it is a fascinating moon in the fact that it has been smashed apart. It has so many different types of, um, of surface upon that one little moon. And Miranda, it's quite a small moon. It's, uh, um, it's only, uh, so I think it's about... Oh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yep, it's uh, 293 kilometers wide. That's all it is, 293 kilometers wide. But the most fascinating uh, moon in, in the Uranian system. And of course, the Uranian system is different to all the other planetary systems because Uranus rotates on its side. So the moons appear to go from north to south instead of uh, around its equatorial region the other way because Uranus is tipped over on its side. So maybe when Uranus was tipped over on its side, it was had probably had an impact from another planetary body, comets or whatever, to cause it to tip over. We don't know why. Um, maybe Miranda got smashed apart at the same time and then reassembled. But it does have a feature on it called the Great Wall, and it's a sheer cliff of 15,000 feet high, the highest cliff in the solar system. And we can see it there. And I think that's absolutely, it'd be absolutely amazing to stand at the top of that and look down uh, on the surface of Miranda, that massive, massive cliff. But as I say, that's the only data we've got. The only data we've got on these moons is what these outer moons is what came back from Voyager. And we know that Voyager is still carrying on to uh, uh, and still transmitting past the heliopause now. And I think Simon got my question right the other night when I said, what's the connection between Chuck Berry and the heliopause, and the and you got did you get that one right? It no. was Voyager, yeah, yeah, it was Voyager. That was the connection. Chuck Berry's on the Voyager disc, and it's beyond beyond the heliopause. And it's amazing to think that these little spacecraft traveling at around sixty three miles a second have only just got past the edge of the solar system since nineteen seventy eight. Unbelievable. So we go and we come to Neptune. We arrived at Neptune. And we were then going to expecting to see what we saw when we saw Uranus. And of course, Neptune shocked us in the fact that it was blue. Um, and we, that gave us an immediate kind of 
home feeling. We're seeing a planet that is blue. It had clouds in the uh, upper atmosphere and it had move features such as the dark spot and the scooter, which was a cloud that orbited uh, Neptune quite quickly. So it was quite fascinating when we arrived at Neptune, better than what we expected. And uh, again, the only data we've got other than and Hubble data is the Voyager data. Neptune has 13 moons. Most of them are small and close in, but it has one on the outer uh, orbit of Neptune, orbiting in a retrograde motion. Um, and this is quite possibly a captured um, Kuiper Belt object rather than a part, uh, rather than being formed around Neptune. It's probably a captured uh, Kuiper Belt object. And Triton, again, the only data we've got is the data that came back. It orbits on a retrograde motion, so it, it, it lends itself to the fact that it was a captured Kuiper Belt object. But this was a fascinating world. Again, we didn't expect to see any activity on any moons out in the outer part of the solar system. And Triton was active. It had got a surface that looked like it had been resurfaced, so it was quite new, quite uh, young. Um, so there had to be some form of geological activity uh, resurfacing the surface. And at that time, back in, 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 the, in the day when Voyager arrived there, we really didn't understand at that time what was going on. And this was where we discovered a thing called cryovolcanoes. They were the first time, it was the first time we'd ever seen cryovolcanoes. Um, and these are uh, volcanoes that are emitting ice and, and vapour from beneath the surface of Titan. And we couldn't understand at the time either what these markings were on the surface of, uh, of Triton. And these are actually... Um, it's dust material ejecting in the cryovolcanoes and falling back onto the surface of Triton. Again, we have very little data on this moon because we only managed to get a small amount of data as Voyager passed and nothing has been out there ever since. So everything we've got is just coming, is just worked out from the Voyager data. We've got very few images of Triton, um, only, uh, I think only a handful of images of Triton that uh, Voyager took on its pass, but we discovered that things could be active in the outer solar system. We didn't think things were going to be active in the outer solar system at the time, and, and that's what we found the first time we'd ever seen cryovolcanoes. Um, we, and, and this is an artist's impression of what a cryovolcano probably looks like on Triton in orbit around Neptune. You can image Triton quite easily these days with uh, modern equipment. Um, but we can't, you know, you're, not, you're never going to see it in any detail. And then we come to the outer solar system um, and, and to the planet Pluto uh, and, uh, and, and, it, and its other planet, Sharon. But this is not um, Sharon or whatever you want to call it. I call it Sharon, Sharon, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's not technically a moon. This is a double planetary system. And the reason being is that they both orbit a central point. They're both orbiting around a central point. Sharon isn't technically orbiting Pluto. They are both orbiting a central point. Um, and it's got other moons there, some smaller moons, which are only a few miles across. But the main one is Sharon, and we can see that from uh, a New Horizons image there. Again, we were shocked when New Horizons reached Pluto, we didn't expect to see an active world. And it obviously is active because of the resurfacing again. Uh, so there has to be some sort of geological activity going on. And in fact, I just completed a, a, um, a John Moore's University course on planetary geology when New Horizons arrived at Pluto. And most of what I learned was thrown out the window because it was then proved to be wrong. Everything we thought was right was proved by Pluto to be wrong. There are so many um, things happening on Pluto that shouldn't be happening. But the main reason we think is because of the close proximity of Sharon is causing tidal forces within Pluto to have it remain active. Pluto has an atmosphere um, and that atmosphere, uh, when Pluto is in its furthest orbit away from the sun, freezes up and falls to the surface. And as Pluto become, is closer to the sun in its orbit, when it comes within the orbit of Neptune, uh, that atmosphere, that the surface warms up again, and that atmosphere uh, again evaporates back into space. So Pluto has an atmosphere. Uh, that atmosphere has been photographed by New Horizons. But as I say, the um, 
looking at Pluto and Charon, they both orbit a central point. They're not exactly, it's not exactly a, 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 a moon planet system. It's a, a double planet system, or if you want to call it double dwarf planet system, as you can see there from that animation. But we move on. We're moving outside of the solar system now. We're moving to look for exomoons. And we've had people on Astro Radio talking about exomoons, where they're looking at the light curves um, of stars to determine whether there are planets orbiting uh, those stars. But they're also noticing that following the light curves of the planets, sometimes there's a, another small dip, which indicates this possibility of a moon orbiting the planet, orbiting a star. So these are exomoons, moons in orbit around other stars. Now you think it's not that long ago since we discovered the first exoplanet. And now we're starting to look at moons in orbit around planets going around other stars. I think it's um, a, a really fascinating time to be doing astronomy now uh, when we're making these discoveries. And if that's happened in that short of time, what's going to happen in the next 50 years? What we're going to be looking at in the next 50 years? Um, I won't be here to see that, but, you know, some people will. And it's going to be very, very exciting, I think. And we're looking at future missions. Um, we've got JUICE uh, going out to the icy moons of Jupiter to look at Ganymede, Callisto and Europa. Um, hopefully taking samples. That, that's a multiple flyby mission in 2022, a joint um, ESA project. And some of, some of the project is also put together by NASA. And that will be going out to... Uh, to take samples of the outer moons. And then we've got Europa Clipper and NASA Jupiter Orbiter going out to do multiple flyby missions, 2023 to 2025, that'll be going. Again, taking samples of those plumes, those water plumes uh, coming out of Europa. So that's gonna be really, really interesting too. And of course, my favorite has to be uh, going out to the World Titan and that uh, Dragonfly mission will be doing multiple sorties and sample examine and, uh, and examine sites around Saturn's icy moon. Dragonfly will launch in 2026 and arrive in 2034. But coming closer to home, we have been to our own moon and we are still landing, um, orbiting our, our own moon. And we're also sending out uh, landers and um, hopefully going back in person really, really soon. And although it's our neighbor, we still of finding out many things about our moon. We're still making lots of discoveries. We don't know everything about our moon, and yet it's so, so close by. And as I say, these are pictures from uh, the Apollo missions. That's one from Apollo 17, I believe, um, uh, back in the 70s. And we haven't had a manned mission since the 70s. But we're still making discoveries. We discovered that there's water in the region of Enceladus. Uh, Enceladus. <laughs> Clavius, in, all, in Clavius. Now, we didn't believe that the water locked up in, in, in the, in the uh, rock in areas that received sunlight, but there is. We didn't believe that till recently, and we found it, and we know that it's there. So hopefully, uh, again, we'll be going out there again to find out exactly what's going on, and it'll be great if we can land a man there, because... Humans are much better than robots. They can look down and identify something that a robot might miss. They look down and see something interesting. And uh, I think manned missions are far, far better than robotic missions. And of course, the Chinese, they're on the moon. They're going out to the moon regular, regularly now. And, that, and they're also on Mars as well now. But uh, this was from their mission uh, that landed on the far side of the moon. Uh, they don't share a lot of data with us, but they do share a little bit. But, it's, you know, the Chinese are there, the Indians are going to be there, uh, the, the Europeans, the Americans, Russians. Um, we're all making a stake on the moon. We're all, we're all going out to the moon. But hopefully everybody will work together and we'll find out more and more. And the more we know about our moon, the more we'll know about other moons in the solar system. By discovering the things that are close up, um, it, it gives you a chance to understand what's going on elsewhere. And that's what I always say when people say, why do we look at the sun? Why do we observe the sun? Well, it's the only star we can see close up. If we don't observe our sun, we, we, by observing our sun, we can understand what's going on in other stars. But never forgetting the old man himself, Neil Armstrong, first human to walk on another world um, way back in uh, 1969. And uh, it's the only place we've actually walked on other than our own Earth. So 
although we're talking about moons in the outer part of the solar system and areas in the outer part of the solar system, we still haven't got uh, physically out of our own doorstep as yet. So hopefully in the next 50 to 100 years, we'll be reaching the outer solar system uh, with human missions. But as I say, that's as far as we've got, but we're making progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Excellent. I've learned lots. Um, and I'm sure you've inspired a number of questions or little ear, uh, sort of earworms and uh, 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 queries that people have got. So um, what questions have, or even just statements about what you've heard have people got that they'd like to bring up? Could, could I ask one? Uh, a couple, actually. Um, what constitutes a moon? How small can it be before it's actually called a moon? This is an interesting one because we have an object orbiting the Earth that's only several feet across, um, and they won't they won't call that a moon. But I I say if it's, if it's a body that orbits a planet, I technically call it a moon. But um, I think the smallest actual moon that we know of is one that is one of the ones that go around Jupiter, and it's about three miles across. So I don't really know what the designation is, but technically we should say that the Earth has two moons. It's got a small object orbiting the Earth. It's only a wow. few feet across, but it's orbiting the Earth. So is it a moon? Who mm. wants it to be a moon? Who's going to say we've got two moons? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Can't see the other one, but we've got two. So we'll, have, we'll, 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 we'll run with that one. Pluto's a planet and the Earth's got two moons. We've changed the nature of uh, the International Astronomy Union's findings tonight. <laughs> the, the other question I had was, do, we, do you ever get a moon around a moon? Do you ever have a situation where a moon orbits a little moon orbits another moon? I've not come across one, but I'm sure it's going to. I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. Okay. Thank you. I've, I've I've never seen any evidence of one. I've never seen one mentioned, but I'm sure it it, it it's got to be the case. It's going to happen. Charles has got a question. He's down the he's down the bottom of my screen. I I did. I mean, actually, I had the same question as Primula because I, I was intrigued by the same thought. Um, I mean, we know we see more and more moons appearing you know, around the gas giants and the ice giants, and clearly, you know, there's no way you'll stop there because there must be mm. hundreds more. But how about Venus? You know, you said I mean, Mercury is very close to the sun, uh, any moon there be disrupted. Uh, Venus is, you know, the planet the same size as ours, not so far from the sun. So mm -hmm. it's quite surprising in a way. So there isn't something orbiting around Venus. Well, I, I think um, that's what... Yeah, I think that's what raised the question. And it was actually last night that that question got raised mm. where I did this talk to Mansfield yeah. last night. And that was raised. Could Neptune, could Mercury have been a moon of Venus? Because no, Venus that's, that's, have... that's, No, that's too big. Am I mean, I'm it's, thinking it's, about sort of, no, a phobos of day demos size thing. Now, of course, if it had been that size, we would have spotted them. Mm. But something much smaller seems to me to be, you know, rather more plausible. And presumably one could almost work out sort of uh, uh, the, the biggest size it could be without having been spotted so far. Mm. But, you know, um, it's just a curious thing. There's nothing at all because asteroids go into that part of the solar system from time to time. And you yeah. thought once in a while they'd be captured by something as big as Venus. Um, and they'd still be there. Mm. It's quite possible. But um, it's, I've always found it fascinating in the fact that, that there isn't a major moon in the orbit of Venus. Yeah, uh, it's always fascinated me. Um, I'd love to a, a comment as well. I mean, you said that um, at the very start, I think, talking about the moon and the Earth, you know, that the moon goes around the Earth rather than they both rotate around the uh, center of gravity. Well, actually, they do both rotate around the center of gra no, gravity. It's just, it's, it's, it, you know, it's rather like you know, Pluto and Cheryl. It's, it's, it's actually inside the Earth, isn't it? Yeah, it's so inside the Earth, the Earth rather so, than. In fact, they're comparable. I mean, yeah. they, no, any two objects or one orbits around the other, it's actually they're both orbiting around a common center of gravity. So, it, you know, that's not a black and white distinction you can make, I think, between thing, a thing being a double planet or a, a planet and the, and the moon. Yeah. So See, we, I, we're, def we're definitely changing the thoughts of the International Astronomy Union tonight. Charles and myself now, we're going to change <laughs> the whole way, the whole way you look at the solar system. Of course, we know, know the solar system is not written in stone, is it? The planets well, are, haven't always been in the positions they're in. No, and they won't always be in these positions. And maybe, like you say, Venus may have had a moon in the past, and it maybe it's got knocked out of its uh, 
orbit and falling in towards the sun or whatever we don't know we can't yeah. Yeah. it's just uh, we only know the solar system as we know it now but we know that jupiter was further in in yeah. the early days and yeah. uh, and so on and it's moved out to where it is and um, so yeah well, I agree with um, you that the Earth Moon system being where it is, being two mm. very comparable sizes, looks very unlikely. So, yeah. you know, as the obvious clue as to why we you know we have intelligent life and mm. hasn't been found elsewhere, that's that it seems to me is the obvious indicator of that. Yeah. But I shall. The <laughs> <laughs> Pali, you've got a question? Ah, uh, yeah. I, I put it in the chat as well. Um I I haven't actually understood you know, right at the beginning, you said that we owe life on Earth to the moon because yeah. it uh, gives uh, uh, the Earth its tilt. I haven't understood the, um, the the physics of it, actually. Well, I mean, there's, there's varying theories as well. Well, I mean, we don't really know why life evolved. I mean, if we knew why life evolved. Oh, no, evolved, about we... the tilt, about why the moon gives the Earth its tilt. Well, it, hold, it holds it in the position. The Earth has obviously tilted over time uh, in, in its formation. It tilted and then the moon has locked that tilt. If the moon, the moon's gravitational pull keeps the Earth's tilt where it is. If the moon wasn't there, the Earth would wobble. It would have nothing to but stabilize it. the moon it. rotates around the Earth. Uh, the moon sort of circles, revolves around the Earth. Yeah. It's like so, a gyroscope. Exactly. So yeah. the tilt is always the Earth's tilt. I mean, it does change its tilt over 20,000 years. We know that yeah. the axis tilt changes. Uh, so the moon um, only has its effect for 20,000 odd years. Yeah. Um, I have another comment, actually, um, as to why Mercury and Venus don't have any moons and Earth is the first planet away from the sun to actually have a moon. And I think it's the gravitational forces, as um, Charles pointed out. I mean, if Mercury and Venus did have moons, the, their, their magnetic field would be overshadowed, overwhelmed by the stronger magnetic pull well, of yeah, the sun. Yeah, that's what I said. I said in the beginning, if Mercury yeah. had a moon, Mercury is so close to the sun, the sun would exactly. have pulled that moon out of orbit. Exactly. And, and maybe the same with Venus as well. Yeah. But definitely, definitely Mercury. Mercury just couldn't have a moon. It did. It, no. it the, the but Earth of the being that much farther away has the ability to retain its moon, I suppose. Well, yeah. But this, uh, this uh, uh, my next question is, do you think that the moon is distance from the Earth is constant? No, it's changing. It's move, actually moving away from us. I think it's about three That's centimeters what I thought. a year. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, so in, if we could come back in a few thousand years' time, the moon would look smaller. Yes. And, we wouldn't, and we wouldn't be able to call it a supermoon anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, you, you guessed I don't like that term, supermoon. So we've um, only got to wait a thousand years to get rid of that term. Okay. Yeah, yeah. if we come back in a thousand years, we can go, there's no supermoon. Um, no. No, it is. It's that, yeah, you're right. It is moving away from us. Um, that's what I said with, with the eclipses at the moment, because the, the, the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun and it's 400 times the, the distance and, 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 and all that it comes into play. It fits exactly over the sun. We're lucky to have that lineup in our lifetime, but in a few thousand years time, that won't happen. And uh, it'll be smaller. So we'll, we're, it'll never come oh. the sun. So you never get a proper solar eclipse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're lucky to have that. In June, is there a glimpse of the future? Mm. So it'd be, it's nice that we can have that. We've got solar eclipse, so we've got something to be thankful for. Um, may I just, while I'm, I've got your attention, just a quick question, <laughs> uh, Simon. It's about a comment you made. Uh, you know, you, you repeated this term quite often about um, these moons uh, being uh, active, um, you know, geolo geologically active. By that, did you mean that they have volcanic, uh, that they have a hard core, hard metallic core, and a, and a, and a, and a layer of molten metal, which brings about these um, volcanic eruptions? Is that what you mean by active? Yeah. What did yeah, you mean by, exactly? By, by active, yeah, the, the, there's internal geology going on where the, the core is still, still active, still molten because of its gravitational forces from the right. planet, this parent planet, that's squeezing it and causing it to... Uh, to have activity within the core 
Um, and then those moons that are further out don't have that. Like I say, Callisto, Callisto in orbit around Jupiter, because it's so far out from Jupiter, it's not as active as the other planets because it hasn't got the same tidal forces ah, on the So you moon. meant that the magnetic forces are at work? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. So, Pete, um, if you, you keep saying that uh, you've got a bet on this planet or this moon or bet on that moon for life. If I limited your cash to one mission, what's it going to be? Titan. Titan. That's my it's always fascinated me ever since I first saw Titan through a telescope when I was a kid. Um, it's fascinating me just looking at that, knowing it's a moon around uh, Saturn. And then, of course, we got out there and discovered that it's it's quite looks earth-like it's not earth-like really is it i mean the mountains are made of ice uh the the lakes are made of methane and as i said the close as john zonecki said at solar sphere i think you was you at, were you at john zonecki's talk um where he said it literally is like lakes of diesel oil um <laughs> and uh you know to actually to it's not like earth but it looked like Earth when that probe went down and you saw the, the, the rivers, the lakes and the mountains. You thought you were looking at Earth and you could see coastlines and that. But it's very unearth like. But I've got a feeling that they'll find something there that we don't expect. You just want to see Dragonfly, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So a great excited. big helicopter thing on Titan. Yeah, don't, don't, don't start on that one. There's so many people email me about the helicopter on Mars and they think it's some sort of Chinook that they've sent up there. Um, and it was, we know it's only like a little drone, but, you know, people, I, I had the local newspaper ring me up and say, uh, oh, you know, that helicopter on the Mars, who's piloting it? I said, well, nobody, it's ro robotic. What, a helicopter's robotic? I said, it's a drone, technically. And I said, what do you expect? And they said, well, a helicopter, because everybody says a helicopter. And I was going, and, you know, I think they think there's a Chinook flying about. What, you know, that's that's the newspapers for you, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've had so many with the newspapers. I had one uh, he, um, contact me, uh, I think it was last year, when um, the moon was supposed to be another one of these so-called super moons. And they said, and, and Mars is going to appear in the sky the same size as the super moon. And then all those people were writing into the newspaper saying they'd seen Mars the same size as the moon. It was the moon in eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is the press for you. And I work for the BBC as well, you know. That's and so they, funny. <laughs> but they do. They, they'll, they'll phone you up and want a story and they want you to go on air to do a story. And when you just tell them the actual facts of how uninteresting it is, like... Well, the moon was the moon yeah. was very very orange one time i mean yeah. last month but it wasn't mars was it no but it was completely orange yeah <laughs> but it wasn't like mars orange in the sky <laughs> but yeah you some of the things i get asked to to, to say on the radio yeah. is unbelievable you know to, um Pete, can I just contribute a point, you know, in, in yeah. terms of migration and um, looking for uh, uh, the next habitat, uh, you know, when the uh, the sun starts to uh, sort of expand on on its, you know, towards its, the end of its life. Um, don't you think that we should do it in stages? And I and I do you not agree. I, I mean, you haven't said you agreed because you've uh, plumped for one of the Jupiter moons. But don't I feel that Mars would be our first sort of uh, base away from Earth? Well, I think first of all, we're going to be we're, it'll be moon bases, won't it? That'll be the first thing because that'll be the staging our post. Moon. Yeah. Our moon. That'll be the staging post to then get to Mars because it's easier to get to Mars from the moon than launch things from yes, the Earth. Yes, but the moon will be within the uh, you know still mm. too close to the sun. Our moon but, will be. I. I I mean, to be honest, I, I, I don't think we'd find if the sun starts to expand and become a red giant, I think we need to get out of the solar system pretty much, really. Yes. Um, I don't think hanging around in the solar system is going to help us by any stretch of the imagination. And and as, and, and with our present thoughts and, 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 and our understanding, that's a long, long, long way off yet. Um, if it's ever going to happen, you know, is it? Look how far it is just to the nearest star. And is there anything inhabitable? inhabitable around the nearest star we don't know um we could be having to travel hundreds and hundreds of light years um and 
I can't ever see that technology happening. Well, we need honest. to mutate. We need to mutate to a certain extent to be able to adapt well, to. Well, I mean, Simon's quite good at electronics. If he can create a body <laughs> that we can transpose our uh, consciousness into, um, and then we'll become yes, immortal. Yes, Simon, how about it? It's yeah, your body. Isn't Elon Musk already trying to do that? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but he's not. He's, he's not as bright as you. Um, oh, you're very kind, but uh, <laughs> wrong. Yeah. You've got a project uh, now, Simon. That's your next. That's your I mean, project. That, when you think about it, the only because uh, people go on about you know aliens coming here, and uh, if if anything ever did come here from another civilization, is it would be robotic. I would have thought, not organic. If there is any other civilizations, that's another thing. Are there any other civilizations? It would have to be robotic because of the distances needed to travel, the lifespan that it would need. And we're going to be the other way. I think the only way we're going to get beyond the solar system is robotically, not in person. But that's just my thoughts. The thoughts in a few thousand years time, they'll think, like I, like I, I said, I look at my books on the shelf here. I've got, I, I collect antique astronomy books, and I've got books that tell you how the sun is made of coal, and how climbing a mountain proves that the sun is cool because the higher you go up a mountain the cooler it gets because you're getting close to the sun. <laughs> These are university textbooks from the 1800s. So, so shows, you know, what we think now, they'll probably look back on in a, in a hundred or so years time and think they were idiots. Well, um, at this risk of sounding a bit um, Indian, uh, it was the discovery of the Indian astronomy that uh, made this huge leap, uh, brought about this huge leap in the 18th century in the West. Mm -hmm. a, a huge leap into the origins of the universe, you know, because uh, the, the, the galaxies were the form, formation. We, we uh, our as astronomers, Indian astronomers, understood that the uh, universe is not geocentric or even heliocentric. The center is beyond what we can see. So it, you know, they, they did have the sophisticated calculation system where they calculated the uh, time uh, that the universe takes to, to come back. Yes, to it's, it's interesting. I, I saw, uh, I had Jim Al-Khalili on one of my shows and he was talking about that. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, are you excited about Juno's extension uh, extended mission? It's been spending its time whizzing around uh, Jupiter, kind of looking down. But the extended mission is going to go out to look at the satellites, the Galilean yeah. satellites. Well, what, what are you hoping they find? Well, again, we're hoping that they find um, more evidence of life on Europa. That's, I mean, it, it's that's 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 the main goal of all these missions, isn't it? Eventually, to find life. The, the goal of any mission uh, out to these remote places is to find the evidence of lo possible life. And uh, I hope they do. And I'm, I'm excited about it because I'm involved with it to a certain extent because of processing the raw data for, uh, for all these um, outreach places across, across the globe. And, uh, you know, I've got, like I say, with the Mars data, I get the Mars data a little bit ahead of um, what it gets published on the web and the same with the Juno data. So I'll get to play with it early on and to be able to play with raw data coming back from the satellites as well is going to be phenomenal. I'm, is that part wait. of the NASA data note program? Yeah. P? Oh, okay. Ah. So, uh, by uh, the way, Simon, yeah. I've sent you a message, um, you know, about these goggles for 10th June. Are you mm. sending those out to people? Uh, it was only to members of Bath Astronomers, and oh. we used up all our stock, oh. so we have no more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. apart from my mine, but these are mine. Yeah. mine, can mine, I have mine, yours? Mine. Nope. Can I have these? <laughs> you can, you can, um, you can get some off Amazon or something like that. They got them on for about two or three quid a pair or something like that. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, one question, Pete. Um, I, I think I read something a, a while ago. That there's some really odd things about the surface of Phobos. It's got tracks and marks and lines across it. H have you ever uh, sort of read about those or found out anything about what the weird tracks on Phobos are? They don't really know. That's the thing. That's why they want to get this, uh, get, the, get this Japanese want to get this mission out there 
to find out what's actually going on. We obviously we've seen the conspiracy theories that there are roads and and, and what have you. Um, but uh, that's what that's what the Japanese want to get the mission out because we we don't understand it, and obviously we're not close enough up to Phobos to to, to take images of it. And the, the orbiters that are orbiting Mars aren't within the area to photograph Phobos, so that's why the Japanese are sending this uh, probe up in 2024 to find out what's going on. Yeah, uh, Pete, think, you mentioned sorry. that. Sorry, sorry. Can sorry? I quick quickly ask yeah. Pete a question about you'd made a comment about the. Um, that moon having split apart and come together again. Uh, yeah. I, I, that I didn't understand either. I mean, how could that happen? How did it split apart? It probably uh, was in Sorry, it's in my notes, but it's gone so dark. I can't. Yeah, my I mean, that moon that split apart, yeah, it probably got impacted by a, another moon in the orbit of, um, of Uranus and it's impacted it and it split it apart. And of course, in, in, a, in, in a vacuum and that objects under gravity come back together and eventually I see. Or less. and that's what's so happened could that be the explanation for this um for the yeah. um, you know the, the Frank, ridge the, the frankenstein effect as we call it mm -hmm. it is like a frankenstein yeah yeah it is interesting but again like i say the only data we got is voyager data and that's really old data so again it's somewhere it, they, there's no plans to send anything out to the uh, to the ice giants for a while yet so it's going to be a but, long time before we get any more info. Yeah, but but you see, the, the latest thing, of course, thinking is that, uh, I mean, going back to our, in my astronomers, is that gravity is flexible. So, you know, you can actually, uh, I mean, we can develop a sophisticated system by which we can control gravity, um, you know, the gravitational force that we work with as we go through space. That sounds very Captain Kirk to me, a bit, bit hyperdrive, a bit warp drive. <laughs> no, but that's how we, we need to yeah. um, conquer other worlds. This is how Depali moves through the holiday crowds through Bath. She just warps space and time. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. the only way you can get up the high street. Them. need yeah. to send them yeah. somewhere else, you know. So, <laughs> social, dis social distancing by gravity, I like the idea of that. <laughs> exactly, you're getting it. <laughs> Uh, uh, very interesting i want to say my thanks give my thanks to pete because it's been thoroughly uh entrancing this whole voyage into the solar system there are so Thank many you. moons out there so yeah uh, i'd like yeah. to echo uh Depali's thanks uh thanks pete for coming along and telling us all about uh the the moons of the solar system and uh, uh giving us potential reasons why poor mercury and venus got left out and um uh, poor no, Mars. they didn't. Got these two the they're ones. close to big mother they're close to mother sun Ah, oh, too much energy oh. on that inner solar system, yeah. is it? Okay. Uh, and then all the a myriad of uh, satellites all the way out uh, to your favourite planet, uh, little old Pluto. Uh, planet, and you, yes. you will fight to your dying day. Um, so <laughs> I, I'll see if I can get Neil deGrasse Tyson and you in a bit of a, a boxing match to see who wins on that one. Um, but you never know. Uh, Alan Stern will be on your side. So you'll probably... Oh, of course he will. He's, he's, he yeah. was on my side last time. <laughs> but thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. Uh, that that yes. this this brings the, an end to our formal uh, proceedings tonight. Yeah. Um, what we do now is I tend to just hang around if anyone wants to chat about life, the universe, and everything. You have permission to run away if you want, Pete, um, um, and everyone else does. But if you wanted to <laughs> chat, that's great. But thanks for a wonderful evening, and uh, yeah. thank you for everyone turning up.